Hello and welcome to Development Dialogues, Rethinking Solutions during this decade of action. Solutions to crises, of course, and the particular situation we're talking about today that is uh, desperately looking for a solution, of course, is the topic of our panel discussion today. Beyond Square Meters, Cleaned, uh, cleared mine action and development. You're very welcome wherever you are around the world. Thank you for joining us. Let me just uh, show you the panel of speakers that we'll be having today. I'll outline a little of what's taking place. We'll be hearing opening remarks from Murad Wawa uh, and also, of, of course, um, uh, listening to Prince Mirad Radzaid Al Hussein. And then there'll be a panel discussion where the speakers you see before you will speak for about eight minutes on their specific expertise in this area. And then after that, we'll be looking forward to your questions and answers. So please uh, look ahead to the question and answer session, make any notes you'd like or any points that are raised that you would like to raise yourself in the Q&A, uh, put them in the chat box and we'll try to get to them as quickly as possible. We're looking forward to a scintillating discussion. So in the 90 minutes or less that we now have, let's uh, get on with this panel discussion. And first here, opening remarks from Murad Waba, who is, of course, the UNDP Associate Administrator. Murad. Thanks, Finola. Uh, Your Royal Highness, distinguished uh, colleagues, friends, Landmines and explosive remnants of war have been known since I started working on the topic as the silent killers. But they are silent no longer. I believe that today we need to join forces to give voice not to um, these objects of destruction, but to the many victims and survivors of landmines and explosive remnants of war, unexploded ordnance, uh, etc. In the past year alone, there have been over five and a half thousand victims. Most of them, two thirds of them are civilians. Full 43% of the civilians are children. And today, as we sit here to join forces to give voice to these victims, to strengthen the development and humanitarian imperative of the clearance of landmines, of advocacy for no more landmines, and for the restoration of vast tracts of land to development and to the livelihoods of human beings, I think we owe to these civilians who have perished needlessly a debt of acknowledging their suffering and of acknowledging their rights as rights holders over us. For UNDP, I think we've been working on the on mine clearance and landmines and explosive remnants of war on the disposal of ordnance and capacity building for national forces, for um, police forces, but also for mine action centers. And we've been doing so in two manners. First, together with our colleagues in the United Nations and with the great leadership of UNMAS. And I'd like to acknowledge Eileen's presence here today, but also with our colleagues in UNICEF and FAO and in other um, parts of the United Nations. This is a collective effort. And it's a collective effort that looks not only at the military aspects, but at the civilian aspects, at victim support, and at the restoration of development hopes. Most recently, we have had with UNMAS a joint mission in the Nagorno-Karabakh. And we're trying to support the governments of Azerbaijan and of Armenia in getting rid of this scourge, just getting rid of it and really sort of allowing the return of displaced persons, of refugees to their homes and to their livelihoods. One of the more memorable, I think, times I have had in my functions at the United Nations and 30 years of that has been a visit to an artificial limb uh, center in Syria. 
and the artificial limb sent in Syria supported by the United Nations and with the help of, I think, of UNDP and UNICEF was focused on children and to see the faces of these children trying on artificial limbs, trying to find joy back after such a trauma, I think is a humbling experience and one that should propel us forward. Sidi, I would like to thank you for your tireless efforts in advocating for an end to the scourge and for victim support. I'd like to recognize the efforts of the Lebanon Mine Action Center of Germany, a long-standing partner of UNDP, and of the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart because together, the silent killer must no longer be silent. We must hear the cries of the victims. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murad Waba there, UNDP Associate Administrator for your remarks. Now, following him, we're going to hear now from Pres uh, HRH, Prince Mirad Radzad Al Hussein. He is the Special Envoy for the Anti-Personnel Mind Ban Convention. He's also President of the Higher Council for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Your Excellencies, uh, dear friends and uh, colleagues, uh, good morning or good afternoon to you all, wherever you may be. I, I hope that uh, everyone is well and healthy and that the terrible COVID-19 pandemic that has been so destructive and uh, menacing will be over soon and that we can all return to our lives as we once uh, knew it. I must pay a quick tribute to all the doctors and nurses all over the world who are fighting the disease day in, day out. And I also wish all those who are presently sick a, a speedy recovery. And for those who have passed on as a result of the pandemic, may they rest in peace among God's angels. Uh, the key to overcoming the COVID crisis, in my humble opinion, is as it is in most or all the great challenges in life, to be disciplined. Governments have to be disciplined and serious and people too. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. To be disciplined is to have a serious approach, to be meticulous, to have a plan and to stick to it, but also to be nimble and flexible when called for. It means to be decisive and to think long term. Discipline is the key to conquering most of life's challenges. I, I have chosen to stress on this uh, point because I, I have believed for a long time that this also rings true uh, regarding mine action. Without serious and highly disciplined, uh, without a serious and highly disciplined approach, success in mine action will always be limited. Countries that have been successful in this regard have been the countries that have given the cause its due. I, I do, of course, understand that in many mine affected states, the barriers to success are much higher and the challenges are much more vexing due to horrid problems such as war, civil strife, poverty, lack of capacity and, and leadership, bureaucracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but at the same time, I refuse to believe that the needle can't be pushed forward. I, I contend that progress in mine action can be attained, measured and sustained if and only if the political will is there. I'm, I'm happy to say that in my country, Jordan, we were able to allot a, con a considerable amount of high level attention to the landmine issue. And as a consequence, donor support was abundant. We, we realized early on that the only way donors would support us was if we were professional, disciplined, and serious about getting the job done. Through sheer hard work and perseverance, everything eventually gelled and we systematically were able to clear all our minefields by soliciting the support of NPA, the Norwegian People's Aid. Many, many or most of these fields that we cleared are now date farms or, or the like, me mega tourism projects, religious sites such as the baptism site where Jesus Christ was uh, baptized and or have been developed for other purposes. 
the, cl the clearance of these minefields and the utilization of the land for development has been fundamental for my country, as we have had to and have always tried to squeeze as much juice out of the lemon as possible. Since Jordan is not a wealthy country, our policy has always been to do as much as we can with the little we have. By developing the land that we cleared, we have got more bang for the buck, so to speak, or we have hit more birds with one stone, to coin another phrase. We, as a developing country in a troubled neighborhood, can't afford to do anything less. It is essential for our survival and prosperity that we plan cleverly and efficiently, put all our talents and resources to good use and to aim to achieve the targets of the SDGs. Uh, clearing the earth of landmines is the central goal of the Anti-Personal Mine Ban Convention, but just as important, but quite often neglected in most mine affected countries, is the goal of victim assistance or survivor rights, as I prefer to call it. Uh, in this regard, in Jordan, we place the heavy emphasis on the issue of human development, especially regarding the rights of persons with disabilities. Having been one of the first countries in, in the region to join the CRPD, we updated our legislation recently by enacting a new progressive law, law number 20 in 2017, that addresses all the uh, fundamental uh, rights of persons with disabilities, including landmine survivors, and are now in the process of implementing the articles of the law. I am, I am not by any stretch of the imagination saying that our situation is ideal. It, it is not. But we are trying to mainstream all issues, such as education, health, employment, etc., uh, to the best of our ability, as without, without it, our path forwards towards true development in the sector will no doubt be stunted. I, I thank the UNDP for extending an invitation to me to take part in, in this uh, virtual event. Despite all the hardships we are facing regarding the pandemic and its disastrous uh, economic impact, we have to try our level best not to fall back too much on our commitments or to lose focus. Mine-affected mine states must roll up their sleeves, stick to their plans and get the job done, ASAP, while at the same time to plan to develop these lands once cleared in a skillful manner for the sake and benefit of their people. And states parties in a position to support must continue to do so in earnest. This is essential. We can't allow donor fatigue to spread. The, the landmine cause is a, is a doable cause. We can and must strike it off the to-do list in the future. But this will only happen if we are serious and disciplined. I thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for your opening remarks. Now we move to the panellists. There will be four panellists speaking for eight minutes each, after which there will be the question and answer session. So as you have been seeing at the bottom of your screen, please put your questions into the live box. Uh, it is very important that you take part in this dialogue in terms of developing this discussion and looking forward for solutions in this decade of action. So let's go to our first panellist, Ms. Eileen. Cohen. She is director of UNMAS. Thank you very much, uh, Fionula. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. I'm very pleased to take part in this panel alongside you and these many esteemed advocates and valuable partners participating uh, in, this, um, in this session. I particularly want to thank UNDP for initiating and organizing this event, for profiling mine action in Fragility Month, and for getting the International Day of Mine Awareness and Assistance in Mine Action officially on the 4th of April off to an early start. The partnership between UNDP and UNMAS is a fundamental one, demonstrated recently, as Murad just said, by our joined up approach to planning and conducting assessment missions in response to the outbreak of conflict in the Ngorno Karabakh. Well, we're here now because we all know that explosive ordnance contamination continues to pose a threat to development in conflict affected countries. Removing the threat is often a necessary precursor to development. And so I'm pleased to have been invited to discuss land release and prioritization. 
Land release is a process of treating land that has been recorded as potentially contaminated by explosive ordnance. The treatment may include technical or non-technical survey and clearance. And clearance can be extremely time consuming. It can be somewhat expensive. And so prioritization based on explicit criteria determined by national authorities is critical. In contexts where humanitarian development and security demands are high, Mine action is usually one of many compelling sectors competing for scarce resources, and the global pandemic has clearly exacerbated scarcity of resources. And so consequently, the criteria for the prioritization of which land to try and release and how to go about releasing it must be principled, nationally owned, cost-effective, data-driven, and responsive to local communities. And I'd like to just go into um, maybe each of those criteria for prioritization a little bit further. So the first consideration in prioritization of which land to focus on and how to treat it is the humanitarian principle of saving lives and alleviating suffering. <clears throat> in practical terms, this means first considering the areas potentially most dangerous to communities. Second, and as we recognize in the UN's multi-year mine action strategy, National authorities should prioritize based on their development priorities. Building national capacity to deliver well priority, prioritized mine action in the long term is the foundation of development planning. We had some recent consultations um, with colleagues from UNDP, UNICEF, uh, NGO providers on this very topic of building national capacity for a sustained response. And we identified some criteria for successful um, national capacity development, including, as Prince Zaid just emphasized, national political will to get the job done, including from the highest levels of government. Um, other, other criteria for success include capacity and commitment to undertake security sector reform, um, the dedication of national budget allocations to mine action, and the establishment of functioning national coordination mechanisms that would allow for regular dialogue among national and international and sometimes regional stakeholders. National governments in post-conflict settings are encouraged to ensure that mine action is reflected in their national development plans, to ensure that contamination doesn't create an unanticipated hurdle to a development project. If an infrastructure or other development project can't avoid land that's potentially contaminated, funds associated with the project should be made available to remove the contamination. Third, prioritized land should be released through the most economical means possible while complying with international mine action standards. Given the expense and time required for clearance, countries should maximize the use of non-technical survey. In simple terms, non-technical survey refers to all of the actions carried out to more accurately define explosive ordnance contamination. So this may include desk assessments, analysis of historical records and other information gathering and analytical approaches, as well as physical visits to field locations. So for example, a non-technical survey could identify areas that are included in a database, but that are actually being heavily cultivated by the local community and are obviously not posing a threat and needn't be um, receiving the treatment of very expensive uh, clearance mechanisms. As non-technical survey is much, much less expensive than clearance, uh, undertaking this approach can free up resources to focus on the high priority areas. In some contexts, of course, marking and fencing has been an effective interim solution, saving lives while resources are generated for clearance. Fourth, prioritization should respond to local community needs. We must seek out and listen to local community priorities, which may be driven by how they obtain fuel or water, how they sustain their livelihoods, how they seek access to health care, how they walk to school, the priorities of women and girls and men and boys, including those with disabilities in a given community may vary and must be understood and addressed in our planning. A fifth and consistent with the Secretary General's data strategy, the smart use and analysis of data should inform prioritization for land release. Data on where and when people are being killed or injured allows mine action actors to address killing zones. In the post-Taliban period in Afghanistan, 
on mass analysis identified that 80% of casualties happened in just over 100 minefields, and prioritizing these clearly led to a large drop in casualties. Data should then be used to identify the critical infrastructure that's being blocked by contamination. In South Sudan, one of the major blockages to economic development were mined roads. Clearing these roads was transformational in enabling and accelerating trade development. All goods that come into the capital city of Juba now arrive on demined roads. Mine action data can also provide vital information about areas that are suspected to be contaminated to avoid large infrastructure projects being planned for these very sites, as I mentioned earlier. It's important that development actors consider potential contamination and reach out to mine action centers as part of their planning processes in post-conflict settings. And finally, translating contamination data into priorities requires us to be forward-looking, bearing in mind likely trends such as urbanization and the growth of specific industries such as tourism in the post-conflict phase. This was successfully achieved in Afghanistan, where the center of Kabul was prioritized for clearance, anticipating the rapid increase in the population in the capital city as refugees and displaced persons returned or arrived in the city in response to improved economic opportunities. In conclusion, we all know that mine action is a critical enabler to development in post-conflict settings. Prioritization of the land to release should be principled, nationally owned, economical, responsive to the specific needs of communities, data-driven and forward-looking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen Cohn, the Director of UNMAS. You raised several important points. We look forward to discussing them later. Let's go now to our next panelist. He is in Lebanon. He is General Jihad Beshali, and he, of course, is the Director of the Lebanon Mine Action Center. General. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you today. I would like to thank you for the invitation to join this distinguished panel. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us here today have seen firsthand the tremendous impact of explosive ordinance on the lives of people in Lebanon, as in any other country and on the country's development. Throughout Lebanon, millions of vulnerable people, including refugees, farmers, PWD, and those living in the remote community still face this threat in their daily lives. It's estimated that the contaminated land yet remaining to be cleared as of the end of 2020 amounted to around 31 million square meters, of which an estimated 75% can be used for agricultural purposes. Also, LMAG ability to operate with our usual speed has recently been challenged by the severe economy and financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. Our dedication of this work has only grown and some incredible achievements were recorded when this country emerged from this crisis, the people will continue to need our support to realize a mine-free Lebanon. If you want to speak about our achievement today, in the face of these tremendous challenges, Lebanon has recorded some incredible achievements we have registered not only at the national, but also at the regional and international level. Accordingly, Lebanon is globally recognized as one of the best managed and most effective national mine action and awareness institution. We at ALMAC realize that practical planning and the close cooperation with all stakeholders is the only path to success of, for the Lebanon Mine Action Program. In 2019, a new year's new six-year strategy was developed with UNTP support for the entire mine action program in a fully participatory approach involving all partners. The long-term desired impact, as stated by the outcome reflect to the recognition of all stakeholders of the link between mine action and development, including the safety, livelihood, and the well-being of the people are at the center. 
the quick release of land and the inclusion of women and people with disabilities. As a number, as member state of the Convention for Cluster Munitions, Lebanon has released 86% of land contaminated by cluster munitions over 10 years. Although Lebanon is not yet a member state of the Anti-Personal Mine Bank Convention, ELMAG is working in the spirit of the convention, abiding by its article and its action, and action plan, including the Oslo Action Plan. In 2020, we launched a country-wide survey to reassess the need of victims as a response of the economic downturn and with the support of, for, uh, from the government of Lebanon. ELMAG distributed in 2020 monthly financial aid to all victims and their families. Having in mind the importance of a speed, speedy land release and the scarcity of resources, ELMAG, with support from UNDP, continuously strive to do the right thing right, study on the improving prioritizing system and on operational efficiency were complete and their recommendation will be applied in 2021. And at present, we are working with the GICHD on how to release contaminated land with difficult terrain futures. The threat to life and the human development posed by mine and the RW has only increased over the last decade. This partly due to 30% population growth caused by the inflow of 1.5 million of Syrian refugees, many of whom live near contaminated areas. Ladies and gentlemen, much remaining to be done to accelerate the progress, LMAC's approach with focus on leveraging the following six success factors. Designing our mine action intervention to contribute to social and economic development. ELMAC joint study with the UNDP showed that every dollar invested in mine action returns more than four dollars to the economy. Mine action can drive progress across many sustainable development goals, including reduction of poverty, inequality, food security, and contribute to peace and stabilization. Realizing that leaves no one behind promise of the SDGs through an, an increased focus on gender and inclusion, LMAC is putting the most vulnerable group at the center of mine action in Lebanon. For the first time, we integrate gender and inclusion in our strategy and design a focal point to monitor progress towards this project. In 2020, we saw a 22% increase in number of women employed in mine action, as well as 13 increase in the number of PD, PWD. We will continue to focus on leveraging mine action to expand access to service and opportunity for women, PWT, and marginal, marginalizing communities. We realize the that prioritizing awareness and explosive ordinance is education at, uh, as the best means of prevention until Lebanon is free of all explosive ordinance. ELMAC will continue to build on social media to enhance awareness for communities and to reach the greatest number of residents in the face of COVID-19 restrictions. We believe continuing to invest in capacity development for results. The key to sustainability cost, effectiveness, and impact of mine action effort in Lebanon is the presence of strong national institutions that can lead implementation of national com com commitment. We have established a strong strategy, planning function, and invested in close cooperation with stakeholders. We will strengthen this function, and they are essential for success in this complex, complex environment. We seek always to engage with international mine action community by being present at all international conferences and, and workshops. We collaborate with our international partners to improve our program 
to improve our program uh, through training, ex exchanging information, and to continue search for best and emerging practice. Elmag believes that the expertise that we have developed has to be shared with other countries suffering from impact of mine, cluster munition, and ERW. The Regional School for Humanitarian Demining in Lebanon was established with the aim to ignite a multiplier effect to capacity development in regional beneficiary countries. Ladies and gentlemen, El Mag wouldn't have been able to sustain the momentum throughout the year and multiple cha challenges without the strong commitment of its partner. We hereby would like to acknowledge the resist, uh, support of our donor, namely the UN Agency, International Mine Action Community. We are grateful for the consistent dedication of the national and international organization. Last but not least, we would like to thank UNDP for their continuous support and thank you. Thank you, General for your remarks and I'm sure that they're going to be uh, included in some of the context for the questions we'll be hearing later on from people who are watching. Next panelist is from Germany, Mr. Wolfgang Binzel. He's head of division for business and human rights at the German Foreign Office. He's also chair of the Mine Action Support Group. Wolfgang. Thank you very much, Fionula. And, um, Mr. Murat and uh, your Royal Highness and dear friends and colleagues, um, thank you to thanks to UNDP for giving me the opportunity to um, raise the issue of the link between development and uh, mine action at this place. Uh, it is a very important subject and it fits um, very exactly um, our uh, own agenda at the MASG uh, Mine Action Support Group. Um, the nexus is an issue we have a particular focus on. Um, and it is needless to say, of course, that um, mine action per se is probably uh, the humanitarian action that is closest at the intersection of the three elements of the triple nexus, peace and security, um, the uh, humanitarian dimension and the development aspect. So whatever you improve in one of these three elements has repercussions in the two other ones. Um, and uh, here, of course, we are focusing on the uh, link between um, mine action and development, which is uh, action number six uh, in the uh, Oslo action plan. Um, and we do have, of course, and Eileen mentioned it already uh, um, in detail, uh, a lot of evidence for this uh, causality. Um, the most obvious impact uh, on development comes from land release after clearance. That, that, that is clear. For example, uh, when we are talking about German projects in mine action, um, a project in Afghanistan with Halo Trust, we are implementing um, succeeded to clear roughly 1.8 million square meters. Um, this uh, affected directly uh, 4,259 persons uh, who benefited from the land release and 10,500 approximately indirectly. 97% of the land cleared um, was uh, used for the grazing of livestock. And uh, just for an example, one of the regions where uh, the land clearance took place, 80% of the population was uh, using uh, livestock as supporting incomes. More than 80% of employment in that region was in the informal sector, meaning that uh, they were very vulnerable in the communities and in the households to external shocks. Um, HALO conducted a, a, a review after uh, approximately one year and asked the households about their situation after the clearance. 90% of respondents reported uh, an increase in income in these months. 
Now, um, we have very similar um, results in very different contexts, be, be it Afghanistan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Ukraine. Um, we always see that um, in the results show how much communities benefit from new access to formerly contaminated areas. But it's not only the release of land itself that contributes to development. Uh, just one example in Afghanistan, to, to take this um, again up, um, the HALO integrated a great number of Taliban fighters, former Taliban fighters, into the clearance teams, meaning that um, this adds to the development dimension as the training um, enhances significantly um, the local capacity and transforms former uh, fighters into productive collaborators. Um, now, it's not only the land, the clearance that is um, positive for development aspects, it is also other aspects of mine action. And I'm talking about victim assistance and of uh, risk education as well. And give you two other short examples um, how that affects uh, the development issue. There is a German funded project in Iraq. Um, with the ICRC that develops a national bachelor study course for physiotherapy and also includes components of mental health and psychosocial support. Um, we expect that this curriculum uh, that was targeted, of course, to, for, as a victim assistance for IS victims, um, it will have a positive effect on medical education across the whole country, benefiting groups well beyond uh, the mine survivors. And in Colombia, another uh, last example, Germany funds a mine risk education project with Caritas. Uh, within this project, uh, 2,000 persons from different communities were tasked to um, establish maps um, of um, ERW risks uh, in the area. Uh, and the, train, the trainer concept passed, of course, knowledge uh, to the local population. Uh, and although this was not a main focus of the project, uh, we realized uh, in retrospective that a lot of, or that the communities uh, learned to cooperate much more intensively by this project and that trust was built within communities, but also between communities. So this also benefited in ways that were not even foreseen in the project. Now, as I said, these are anecdotal evidence uh, for the beneficial effects of mine action. What is more difficult, of course, is to systematically evaluate uh, the development impact of mine action in general. Um, it's not an easy task. You have to develop a methodology um, and to measure the exact impact. Um, I do believe that we came to a moment where this becomes very important, actually. Um, development aspects have become more into the focus of mine action projects recently. And this might be a, a good sign, uh, a sign of maturation of mine action, um, where in the first place, in the first 15 years after the Ottawa Convention, mine action victim numbers decreased significantly. Um, so uh, the need to save lives is there, is still the first, uh, the first rationale in mine action, but um, there is room, perhaps more today than in the early 1990s, to think beyond uh, the square meters and to think about the development impact. Now, this is one important aspect. I see another one I would like to mention, and this has to do with the global situation, um, uh, the global humanitarian situation also in view of the pandemic. Um, and um, the, the need for more accountability uh, for um, for outcome-oriented uh, log frames and for evaluations um, may be the result of the dramatically increased um, humanitarian needs worldwide. Um, growing needs due to many conflicts in the world, growing needs also to uh, climate change, and of course now um, uh, multiple 
multiplied by uh, the effects of the pandemic. Um, so the gap between available funding and needs is widening and it will widen in the future further as um, the donor countries struggle to cope with the costs of the pandemic and the uh, developing countries will fight uh, for a long time with uh, the consequences of the disruptions. And under these circumstances, competition is much stronger today than it has been maybe in the past, in the past four, four, 10 years ago. Um, this increases the need for th thorough justification of any request for funding, um, and hence the increased stress on the development dimension in mine action as well. I, um, and, and Germany, I would like to f finally, we would like to mention that Germany supports this increased interest and need for information about the link between mine action and development by funding a research project um, that is going to be implemented by GICHD, here present with Ambassador Toscano, and the UNDP in the next uh, few, uh, two years. And the aim is to de develop a methodology um, to measure the development outcome of mine action and then to apply the results uh, to different contexts. Uh, we have chosen six local uh, uh, research frameworks um, very different to show the different aspects of the methodology. Um, we will start in 2021 with the three contexts, Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, Ukraine and Somalia. And next year we will add to this Afghanistan, Iraq and South Sudan. And we hope that this study will help us to understand better the link between development outcome and mine action. And from there to tailor even more the projects to the needs uh, within specific regional contexts and then further support the inclusion of development uh, outcomes into national mine action strategies. And by the way, we will be happy to present the results in the donor group uh, in 2022. Thank you very much. Mr. Wolfgang Binzel there from the German Foreign Office, thank you very much. You raised some interesting points about data gathering and uh, its linkage to funding and development. So we'll be talking about that later in the Q&A. Next uh, panellist is our final panellist of this session, Ambassador Stefano Toscano. He is the director of the Geneva International Centre for Humanitarian Demining. He is our final speaker, as I said. So please get your questions ready. You're welcome to put them in the live box on the YouTube page. Ambassador. Many thanks, uh, Fanula, for giving me the floor. Um, Mr. Murad, Your Royal Highness, dear colleagues, partners and friends, let me first uh, extend my thankfulness to UNDP for having invited the GSEHD to uh, be part of this timely event. It's much appreciated. So, dear colleagues, um, after 30 years of my inaction, I believe it is fair to say that there is widespread recognition of the role of mine action in development and vice versa. The mine action and development communities uh, have worked as close partners for decades. However, such proximity has not necessarily translated uh, into aligned planning, monitoring, and reporting efforts. As in other sectors, mine action has at times been designed and conducted in a silo and is focused typically on output rather than outcome level results. Thus, challenges remain to ensure and measure mine action's holistic impact in the medium and long term beyond the square meters released, as Wolfgang was referring to. Now, the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals has made such an alignment much easier to achieve. As UNDP and the GCHD pointed out in a study published in 2017, the 2030 Agenda provides an overarching framework and specific entry points in the shape of goals, targets and indicators to make the role of mine action in sustainable development more clearly identifiable and at the same time foster policy coherence, better planning as well as outcome level monitoring and reporting. To put it bluntly, what the study is saying 
is that mine action is more than mine action and that the 2030 agenda is the best path towards articulating that clearly, comprehensively, and in a manner allowing for better monitoring and reporting. From that follows the need, as pointed out in the Oslo Action Plan of the Mine Ban Treaty, and I quote, to strengthen partnerships and integrate responses between the mine action community and relevant humanitarian, peace building, development, and human rights communities, bearing in mind the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, end of quote. I firmly believe in the fundamental importance of ensuring that mine action delivers tangible contributions to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. This is not only the right thing to do. Down the line, it will also help generate win-win partnerships across sectors and ensure that mine action becomes part of SDG-driven resource mobilization efforts. Additionally, linking mine action to longer-term development efforts provides a significant boost towards strengthened national ownership. Now, how can we make sure that mine action finds its way into the implementation architecture and the results frameworks of the 2030 Agenda? Our experience points to three distinct line of action. The first calls for integrating mine action into national SDG frameworks. Let me give you a specific example. The SDG framework in Bosnia-Herzegovina foresees the inclusion of a national SDG 18 with three associated targets addressing landmines and cluster munition. You might know that Cambodia and Lao PDR have, by the way, followed a similar approach. Additionally, Bosnia-Herzegovina Voluntary National Review contains references to mine action and generate linkages between demining and several SDGs. This is advantageous. On the one side, it ensures coherence in national planning efforts while breaking down sectoral silos. On the other, it allows for measuring mine action contribution to national sustainable development efforts. Second, as the flip side of the coin, aligning mine action strategic planning and reporting with the SDGs is requested as well. As you might know, the GCHD provides support to affected states in their efforts to develop national mine action strategies. We are currently supporting Afghanistan in that, and I trust that I can disclose that the current draft of the new National Mine Action Strategy establishes as one of its goals, well-coordinated and integrated mine action contributes to the fulfillment of the SDGs. This is still work in progress, but noteworthy nonetheless, specifically from the viewpoint of ensuring national ownership and alignment of mine action activities. Finally, we see a continued need to enhance sectoral knowledge and understanding of the SDGs and how they are linked to the mine action. The GCHD is currently implementing various initiatives to increase the use of the SDG as an, an analytical and planning framework. In our experience, some mine action stakeholders still need to strengthen their ability effectively to mainstream the SDGs into their work. And it is in response to this need that we have just finalized a new training package suitable for in-person or virtual delivery. We also have plans to develop an e-learning module in the coming months. Dear colleagues, the GCHD will remain committed to this significant area of work, both in terms of generating knowledge and of disseminating knowledge at field level and to working in partnership with UNDP. With respect to generating knowledge, let me say this. While the connection between mine action and development is largely unknowledged, further evidence is needed to detail and help clarify the transformative power of mine action. Wolfgang was pointing to this point. Thus, we will continue documenting the sustainable development outcomes of mine action through case studies. I'm glad to announce in that regard the launch of a study entitled 
the sustainable development outcomes in my next, of mine action in Jordan that will take place on April the 1st. This research was conducted by the GCHD with the support from the Jordanian authorities and UNDP. It demonstrates clearly how mine action directly contributed over the years to more than 60 SDG targets, more than 60 SDG targets. We look forward to sharing the findings in more detail with, you, with all of you soon. Allow me here to express my sincere thanks to your Royal, your Royal Highness Prince Miret and UNCDR Director Breikat, who were instrumental in turning this case study into reality. As mentioned, UNDP and the GCHD have plans to conduct additional case studies thanks to the generous support of our donors, including Germany, Ireland, Italy, and Switzerland. Dear colleagues, to conclude, the continuous refinement of humanitarian and development outcomes resulting from mine action will strengthen the evidence on the role of mine action in fostering the SDGs respectively the triple nexus between humanitarian development and peace initiatives. Conceptualizing, planning, and operationalizing mine action as a significant contribution to sustainable development will make the transformational impact of mine action more measurable and more visible. It will also pave the way to strengthen national ownership and sustainability via better alignment with national development plans and hopefully open the door to additional resource mobilization efforts. Let us all continue to work together towards ensuring that no one is left behind. Thank you so much. Ambassador, thank you so much. Mine Action is more than mine action. We look forward to hearing perhaps a little more in the Q&A session about that study um, carried out in Jordan. Um, we're going to go to our panelists now for a question and answer session. Some of your questions from around the world are coming in. I'm looking forward to getting to them in just a moment and uh, keep them coming in as we want to get a scintillating discussion and as scintillating a discussion, I should say, um, underway as possible in the next few minutes. My first question really relates um, to the panel here and it will be to Eileen Cohn. Um, essentially we heard Wolfgang there talking about the importance of data, the increasing importance of data gathering in determining the kind of funding that's going to take place. He talked about the accountability um, of international organizations and nations when it comes to funding and we're of course fully, fully focused on the linkage between mine clearing and funding for development and that dialogue that's taking place in relation to that. Eileen, in your remarks, you made reference to being forward looking. Um, you raised a number of points, but you did also raise data gathering. How easy or difficult is it to gather data in the field uh, in real time um, over a long term development of a community that's emerging from crises? hopefully something more sustainable. Thanks, Fianula. Well, I think the short answer is extremely difficult. And I, I immediately uh, took note of the, uh, the study that uh, Wolfgang mentioned that they're working on with uh, the GICHD and the fact that Stefano mentioned that they have studies from uh, previous years. Because uh, for as long as I've been associated with the mine action sector and go back to 2003 when I first uh, joined UNMAS, we've been talking about wanting to be able to tell the impact story. And um, while that's difficult for, for UNMAS as an entity because we tend not to stay in a location uh, after things have moved on and national uh, actors take over with the support of NGOs and UNDP and others, um, still we've found it difficult as a sector, even working together to um, not, not only to gather the data, but even to establish the appropriate metrics because the clearance of a, of a road or the effort we undertake to make a road safe or a particular uh, piece of land safe, um, doesn't indicate clearly how to measure the number of users or the economic benefit of the use, right? So we may be able to indicate how many, how much traffic is on the road, 
but what does that tell us about the economic impact of the traffic or the health impact or the education impact of the traffic? I mean, mine action as an enabler is clear, but to quantify what has been enabled by allowing people to move safely and work the land safely and use the land safely seems to me um, extremely, extremely difficult. I mean, maybe it's... Um, it, it, it almost seems that we should be having um, economists and, uh, you know, it, other areas of expertise joining in uh, instead of kind of struggling uh, internally within the mine action sector uh, on this question. So I, I hope to, to hear that um, Stefano and, and Wolfgang and, and the investment in the studies will broaden out to bring in other areas of expertise. I'm sure UNDP has decades of um, experience trying to measure these very complex impacts. So well, let me just stop there with where I started to say that gathering data um, on, well, not just the impact, but even just the immediate effect of the contamination, e even just knowing um, how to count the impact on uh, individuals, uh, victims or survivors, and what that means for their families, their income, their children's welfare, even that's extremely difficult due to um, access and language and trust with communities. So um, of course we rely on the NGO partners and local uh, partners who are much more familiar and able to gather that sort of information. But even at that very um, immediate and um, immediate impact level, I would say, um, very difficult is how I would categorize the the answer to your question, Fiona. Well, thank you, Eileen. I mean, you, you you really outline that there are so many variables to take into consideration in these challenges of gathering data, and you also referred to uh, UNDP's experience in in gathering data. And so, for Murad Waba, who is still with us, I would like to ask you to comment, if you can, on the importance uh, of gathering data as we move forward, and as Wolfgang said, its strategic importance for continued funding. Thank you very much, Finola. And uh, I'll defer also to um, Ambassador Toscan on this, but I think Aline's right. It, it is very, very difficult, but before sort of going there to, into the data stream, I, I believe that it's very important to set out right, right at the outset that clearing landmines, clearing unexploded ordnance is a good in itself and shouldn't be subject to, to we say, economic calculations or profit and uh, loss calculations. But uh, there are two considerations I'd like to bring forward. The first is in prioritizing different areas for uh, mine clearance, how do we establish the priorities? Where do we look at, say, populated areas, more urbanized areas versus, say, rural areas or more sparsely uh, populated desert areas? And the second uh, area, which is, I think it's complicated, but there is an economic benefits uh, calculation, very similar, in fact, to analysis of infrastructure, whereby we can do a, a before and after uh, study. But again, the clearance of landmines and unexploded ordnance, explosive remnants of war, and I saw there was a comment on IEDs, is a good in itself and is not subject to economic calculation. Thank you. Thank you, Murad, for, for your response. And before we go on to the next question, I promise we are going to a question from the audience. Um, I'd like to just ask for a comment because uh, from the ambassador, because uh, Wolfgang, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, not Wolfgang, but uh, Murad mentioned that the ambassador might have something to say on this matter, and there we'll leave it in terms of the data gathering. But ambassador, any views? No, thank you very much. Uh, I just I concur with uh, the, the the comments from Eileen uh, and and Mr. Murad. Just to say that uh, indeed there has been an effort to conduct studies uh, uh, on uh, on this link uh, between the two, and one of the first that were presented was a, a study by the London Business School that was trying to measure the economic impact of mine action in Mozambique uh, via measurements of the intensity of street lights in, in, at night time. Uh, so you, you, you can see that you can find the various uh, proxy indicators for this. Uh, there was a first study 
Further studies were conducted uh, by us with UNDP. Um, but the, what I think it's important here is that on the one side, we continue these studies. We need to be rigorous and serious, uh, as uh, Prince Mirad has, has said, uh, to, to demonstrate this link. But we can also do two things. One is that uh, we should insist when we work with partners on strategic planning that uh, strategies on mine action include uh, appropriate theories of change uh, with uh, outcome level and outcome level indicators. And on the other side, let us not forget that uh, information management is one of the key uh, capabilities of mine action. And uh, we should take advantage of that. Uh, every mine action program uh, is based uh, on an information management system. And it might suffice to connect that information management system with additional data gatherings uh, to help support uh, uh, the data that we need to, to gather for measuring further than what we used to measure so far. So I think uh, we are well equipped uh, to move ahead on this, uh, but it is indeed important to be rigorous and to keep on providing evidence about this linkage. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, response there. Uh, it's something that I know that you, you have a lot of views on that you've just shared. I'd like to go to a question from one of our viewers now. Keiko Tamura, which step could we take in order to facilitate more coherent and a coordinated approach between mine action and other UNDP's areas of work? So this is a question for Murad. I know you have to leave shortly, so I thought I would uh, pile on the pressure while you're still here. So again, just uh, once more, the question is, which step could we take, Murad, in order to facilitate more coherent and a coordinated approach between mine action and other UNDP's areas of work? Thank you very much for this one. Um, thanks, Finner, and thank you, Keiko. I think three areas where I'd like to focus. Um, the first is that there's a lot of work that's currently being done anyway to have mine action inserted in a coherent um, development strategy, restoration of civilian life, if you like, and recovery of livelihoods, a strategy anyway, and that is being done. But you're right, not enough is being done. And not enough is being done because mine action is a very sort of focused, specific area of work. And we need to see uh, that area in, as I think a previous speaker mentioned, the nexus uh, in the context of allowing access to humanitarian relief, allowing uh, really sort of peace building uh, to take place in certain contexts. And the third, the third point is uh, the link that His Royal Highness had uh, referred to, which is link with economic activity, opening up um, new lands, opening up to development, to tourism development. And this has to be thought out, not seen as an individual element. But lastly, and there I think we're not doing enough. And I believe we should be doing far, far more both as an international community, but also as UNDP, which is to link up mine action to um, supporting people living with disabilities. I believe there's a sort of gap there. I know much is being done, but not enough given the state of the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Murad, for that uh, um, uh, comment and that response. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to go now to a question from a gentleman, uh, somewhat named uh, Bob the Bomb. And his question is for Wolfgang in Germany. Bob says he helped with the prioritization study that the general mentioned in Lebanon. Could such a best practice guide help donors establish the benchmark? Could such a best practice guide help donors establish the benchmark? And just before you answer that, um, I, I might go to the general afterwards as he's, if he's happy for a follow-up comment. But over to you, Wolfgang. Thank you, for your, and th thanks for this question. Um, the, the short answer is yes, definitely. Um, donors are always in need of uh, orientation and such a best practice guide can, can provide this. Um, and what I would like to mention is perhaps just to, to put yourself in the situation of the donor, uh, how is the decision mechanism when it comes to 
um, the decision of funding a specific projects somewhere. Um, there is certainly a strategic layer uh, when it comes to the cho uh, choosing the, the region. Um, uh, we know, for, for example, Germany has a mine action strategy um, where we have identified 10 priority areas where we uh, would li uh, focus li like to focus on uh, when it comes to mine action. Um, the, the identification of these areas may have to do with political priorities, but it may also have to do with um, objective criteria like national ownership in the country, uh, responsiveness, experience from former times, and so on. So, but this is probably something where um, such a best practice guide will not be decisive. The next level, when you have chosen a certain region and then you are looking for the right project to fund, then this sort of information comes in and would be extremely helpful indeed. Um, I do believe that it is perhaps relatively easy or uh, it's a lower hanging fruit uh, to prioritize between different clearance areas because you can probably find indicators, numbers, how many people are living in the area and so on, this kind of uh, things, and then choose the um, most efficient, uh, most effective clearance area. Uh, when it comes to comparing um, different uh, sorts of mine action, like victim assistance or uh, uh, risk education or clearance uh, if you have a limited amount of funding. Uh, this is much more difficult, of course, and I believe there is a lot of work that is to be done uh, in order to allow for more, uh, for better information base. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, General, you talked in your opening remarks about the key to sustainability being alignment of strong national institutions. Can I ask you about the importance of donor coordination? You know, uh, you, you're on the ground. How do they do it? What do you think is the key to success here? Uh, you may need to unmute, you, unmute yourself, General. Thank you. Uh, if you want to speak about the, the cooperation with donors, with donors, we in Lebanon, we organize forum each six, six months. This, uh, this uh, meeting uh, it, uh, will be with donor and all the stakeholders, we spoke about our our vision for six months. We put uh, our action action point uh, for this six months, and the donor uh, can observe our our achievement if we achieve this this point. So uh, this relationship between donors and us uh, give the. Uh, Trust between our uh, our uh, our our office and uh, the donors and the stakeholders in the same time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, General, for your question. I'd like to turn. Oh, Ambassador, you might need to unmute. Thank you. Uh, no, I just wanted to add my voice to that of uh, the General uh, Director of Elmac to to really. Um, emphasize how important this uh, approach uh, in Lebanon has been and what a game changer it is because um, you know convening all the stakeholders and having them sit around the tables uh, under the leadership uh, uh, of the affected state is the way to go is the way to go in terms of national ownership uh, is the way to go in terms of coordinating efforts uh, and uh, is the way to go, I think, uh, also in terms of uh, maybe resource mobilized. So um, within the two conventions that guide our efforts, uh, there are similar approaches. One, by the way, has been uh, uh, promoted in particular by Germany. It's called the country coalition approach, the other individualized approach. And, and this is uh, concretized at the country level in Lebanon via this Mine Action Fora. And I really would like to, to, to 
praise uh, Lebanon and, and, and Norway in particular, who has been working closely with uh, uh, Lebanon on this, uh, but also all other stakeholders, uh, and really emphasize how strong this instrument can be to accelerate uh, uh, results uh, via better coordination and uh, stronger national ownership and resource mobilization. All right. Ambassador, thanks very much. I'd like to move, if I may, to His Royal Highness um, and ask a question which is related. I mean, you've had a lot of experience and you're a global champion when it comes to the linkage between um, mine clearance and development. I'd like to put a question to you, who's, which has come in from a member of the audience, our virtual audience. George asks, how do we increase national and international interest in and funding for long-term victim assistance programs to the same level as clearance? Uh, thank you, George, for the question. Uh, there is no real uh, magic bullet, but there, there are certain, uh, I think, uh, do's and don'ts or ABCs. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, they, they are quite evident and quite obvious. I mean, one has to be... Uh, forthcoming, one has to be transparent, one has to be accountable, uh, one has to engage uh, seriously seriously with do donors, uh, uh, foreign donors and local donors. Uh, it's, it's not an easy task, but it's, it's continuous advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. Um, when it comes to, uh, I, think it's, I think it's also very important that, there, that the legal structures are in place and that uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, acceding to the CRPD, no, uh, number one, uh, uh, having, a, having a law for the rights of persons with disabilities uh, is, a, is, another, is another thing. Uh, you can't talk about uh, victim assistance if, if you have no uh, lo uh, domestic legislation uh, regarding the, persons of persons, the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, there are, of course, a, num a number, a number of different things that need to be done, and it's 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 not not an easy task. And in uh, uh, in, in all honesty, it's it's my uh, my bread and butter. It's what I've been doing uh, for now for for many years is uh, advocating for the rights of persons with disabilities in Jordan, including, of course, uh, landmine victims. But it can be done, and it, I think the most important thing is that the, the belief the belief that it, it can be done. And uh, one has to show, um, uh, it has to, one has to be clear, and the clarity, I think, is, is so important. One has to show the integrity. Uh, there, there are a number of different things that uh, an organization working for the, the for survivor rights or um, victim assistance uh, that needs, to be, needs to be done. But, uh, the most important, I think, is to believe that it can be done and, and yeah, resources can be uh, garnered. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness. Uh, Murad Waba has to leave us in the next few minutes, so I'd like to come to you, if I may, just uh, for a comment on what you've heard so far, but then a rather specific question, I suppose, about the UNDEP's commitment um, to this area of work, especially as you're moving into your next strategic plan for, I think it is 2022 to 26? Yeah. Um, well, I think commitment is there and undisputed. Again, I believe that for a UNDP role in mine action, um, it has to be a development role. And therefore, it cannot be a UNDP role alone. It has to be done in concert with other members of the international community, with other members of the UN family. And again, perhaps if I may stress uh, unmasked leadership uh, in this. But as we move from the clearance uh, of contaminated areas, as we move forward with uh, explosive remnants of war, also, and, and with that, I think there's a strong need, I just commented earlier, advocacy on um, recognizing and protection from IEDs. I believe that a strong development uh, imperative is there and is there as a long-term support to our humanitarian and uh, peacekeeping colleagues. Well, thank you very much for that response, uh, Murad Waba, uh, who is 
UNDP Associate Administrator. Thank you. You've been very generous with your time and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing more developments on this line. Thank you for your recommitment. Uh, a, a question though to Eileen as a result of uh, what Morad had to say there in his closing uh, response. Um, he, he did say kudos to UNMAS, but how difficult is it to work on development when you're still in the process of clearing landmines and the the you know the amount of IEDs that are still so prolific. Thanks, Fianula, and thanks, uh, Morad, for for raising the issue. It's a a, a very uh, difficult issue for us, and uh, an increasing scourge in places that we're working um, as peacekeepers, and uh, I'm sure in many places that. Uh, colleagues and, and members of the, the, the viewing audience are also experiencing. Of course, for us in peacekeeping, in um, Mali, in uh, Somalia, the threat of um, improvised explosive devices is um, one of the biggest inhibitors to our ability to deliver um, these mission mandates. It's one of the biggest threats affecting um, MINUSMA, where we've had incidents against 16 different uh, troop contributing countries in recent years. We've taken a number of um, cruelties and really struggling with how to um, improve prevention given the terrain and the, um, the tasks that the troops have to take. Of course, this says nothing about the in increased and um, really dramatic effect that it has on, that IEDs have on communities. I'm certainly um, inclined to believe what Murat said about the importance of de development to uh, diminish the, the impetus um, for communities to um, be used by uh, armed groups as, um, well, to, to, to in, in this, uh, the, the process of, uh, designing, developing, implanting, exploding um, IEDs. But um, in the absence of prevention, which um, uh, the development aspect of prevention will, will take quite a long time and is quite challenging. Other aspects of prevention include security sector reform. I mean, it's very important that uh, security sectors, law enforcement, uh, defense capabilities in affected countries have um, the training and the equipment to uh, protect their communities and to protect themselves while they are um, delivering security. Issues like precursor trafficking that the Security Council has tried to address, for example, through the sanctions regime for Somalia are ambitious. They'll be very difficult to enforce, perhaps with greater regional intelligence across security institutions and across governments. Um, there may be some increased ability to address trafficking, for example, of weapons or ammunition that may become um, a source of, uh, of IEDs. But things like a fertilizer are going to be um, impossible, I believe, to um, address through efforts to, um, to to address precursor trafficking. So uh, prevention looks very difficult in long term. In the immediate um, case of mine action programs, I think it's also important to recognize that at the technical level, these are very different skills. Um, we've had to acquire some very specialized uh, expertise to be able to even just conduct and develop training and uh, threat mitigation, um, sort of risk education for communities, for our staff, uh, for the humanitarian community um, on how to uh, detect and avoid IEDs. We talked about how much improvement we've had among some of the troop contributing countries in detecting and um, defusing IEDs before they explode, but um, the threat remains incredibly high. I just maybe close by saying that, you know, if I think for a number of national authorities, the fact that the victim operated IEDs are considered you know, within the, 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 the APMBC as um, anti-personal minds of an improvised nature 
affects um, the way things are recorded uh, legally and the way they may, um, the way these devices may impact on a, a state party's ability to complete their treaty obligations. So there are, you know, data management, recording and um, reporting and compliance issues related also to these um, devices that mine action programs have tried to support national authorities to address. Um, yeah, I, I, I could go on and we're struggling with this in, in Burkina Faso, uh, in, in addition to the places I've mentioned, Somalia and Mali, Nigeria, um, Afghanistan, I think, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, just a very, very uh, difficult problem to address and, and one that's really un unabating. Uh, thank you, Eileen. And in the final moments that we have before our closing remarks, um, I would like to ask each of you very briefly for your reflections. I'll start with uh, His Royal Highness, Highness in a moment, but your reflections and perhaps uh, what we might do better. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what mo I think uh, there's a lot we can do better. I think, like, uh, you know, we, uh, we, ha we, uh, in every field, when it comes to mine action, uh, in every aspect, I think we can do better. I, I think we need to keep uh, our eye on the ball and uh, not not get uh, dist distracted. I, I worry sometimes, uh, you know, if I can just very quickly talk about uh, in, uh, my, my, in my capacity as a special envoy, I, I fear that, uh, that uh, there will be a loss of interest in the in the convention in the, in the future, and uh, so it's up to us, the, those of us who are working uh, for this cause, to to make sure that it stays uh, healthy, and we keep uh, look after the the stamina of the of the convention, and uh, and uh, make sure that the states, parties, countries that are part of the convention that they do and are mine affected uh, do what they're supposed to do and uh, and uh, stick to their plans and not uh, fall by the wayside and uh, okay. there, there are there are many countries that have uh, uh, requested extensions and have received extensions but uh, have, have not uh, stuck stuck to their plans and and then of course the question of uh, victim assistance or survivors rights uh, uh, i have been taking part in the meetings of the states parties for the last uh, 16 17 years and Sometimes it's like a broken record. We just hear the same thing over and over, and over and again, and and then right. and, and the fact that the persons with disabilities or mine affect those who have been affected by landmines uh, uh, have, are still waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to receive uh, so, some kind of support or to be afforded their rights. Uh, thank, the, you. So. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're running really short on time, but I really want to hear from each of you very, very quickly, if I may. General, your reflections. Yes, for me. Yes, thank you. For me, I, uh, I think if we increase the link uh, on socio-economy and life, food, environment, stabilization, and uh, good uh, cooperation, uh, international cooperation between uh, uh, the uh, office, national office uh, for mine action and uh, the stakeholders and the donors at the same time. And if we can distribute uh, the donation uh, for the state need, like uh, Lebanon, for example, I give you Lebanon. Lebanon is, uh, is not uh, uh, a rich uh, state. We need funds always. And uh, the donor, uh, now we have a leg in donation to continue our, uh, our, our demining, our, our clearance in Lebanon. Okay. So uh, if we can do okay. a link between You've frozen, uh, you frozen there, General, you. just briefly, but you're with us. Thank you. You're back with us. Thank you very much. Wolfgang. Thank you. Uh, I mean, one of the questions that was posed here is how uh, the development sector can better cooperate with the mine action sector. Sector. I believe this conference uh, was a very good start. Um, and uh, I, 
uh, apart from perhaps a more institutionalized cooperation in this sense or exchange of, of uh, ideas, um, we will also need to think about project design, uh, taking into account on the one hand side the, the um, mine action um, rationality and on the other side uh, the follow-up actually, what we are going to do with that and, and look at the outcome. Perhaps in the project design we will have to think further than so far. Thank you, I will leave it here. All right, and a quick reflection from you, Ambassador. No, I don't think that uh, drastic changes are, are necessary. My action has been there for, for many decades and is a mature sector, but uh, I think it's important, uh, as others said, to keep on recalling that uh, my action is a response to a humanitarian imperative on, on the one side, to conventional obligations uh, on the other side, but also that uh, we need to demonstrate better that, as I said, my action is actually more than my action and better planning and uh, looking at outcomes uh, and all those things that we talk about will help uh, in that regard. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We need to now go to the closing remarks uh, from our final speaker from whom we're going to hear today. And it is Nick Beresford, who is the UNDP resident representative in Cambodia. Nick. Thank you, Fionnula, and uh, a great pleasure to uh, join everyone on this uh, development dialogue. Um, my thanks to His Royal Highness Prince Marit, uh, Murad Wahab, and uh, the panelists that we've had joining us uh, uh, tonight or, or this morning, depending on your time zone. So I've been given the impossible job of trying to summarize this rich discussion. So uh, rather than try to do that, I'm going to give maybe three points that I think help uh, link some of the themes that I've been hearing from uh, the speakers. And, and I think one the first theme that I was hearing is that successful mine clearance demands connected development. So, you know, Morad spoke about the fact that we in UNDP can't do this on our own. We need our UN family. We need UNMAS leadership. We need government ownership. And this is something that Prince uh, Mahreb uh, spoke very powerfully on this idea of national ownership to get the job done. Um, and uh, Wolfgang also linked the mine clearance to, uh, to development plans. And this is the way that we bring in good coordination between development partners um, around this essential task. The second theme I, I see as weaving through the, uh, the, the different presentations and discussions was um, this idea of landmine clearance. Landmine clearance is about human development. And we heard from Prince Mahred the, uh, what happens immediately after uh, the contaminated land is released back to communities. And there in, you know, in Jordan and in countries like Lebanon, we, you know, we can see um, date farms and agriculture. We see uh, religious sites that are now safe to visit and people can worship. And we see tourism um, sites that can be enjoyed and that local communities can then uh, reap the benefits from that industry. Um, you know, General Jah uh, Jihad spoke about the experience of uh, Lebanon. 75% of mine contaminated land can be used for agriculture. Um, and uh, work by UNDP Lebanon showing that a $1 invested in mine clearance can have a $4 payback in terms of development returns. Um, Lastly, on this point, I thought also to note uh, Ambassador Stavano's comment that uh, no, mine action is more than just mine action, but how to make it more than mine action, how to make it linked to human development. And that's through the SDGs. And here in Cambodia, our 18th Sustainable Development Goal is indeed a mine-free Cambodia, um, as it is next door in, the, in Laos. So linking the... Uh, uh, the the uh, mine clearance agenda within the SDGs is a good practical way about making progress on a wider human development agenda. And the last theme I, I, I wanted to note uh, um, uh, that I picked up from, uh, from these discussions is that mine clearance is fundamentally about people's human rights. And it's about not just the right to life, 
but it's human rights in general. And I think that, you know, um, we heard from Eileen, for example, the need to listen to the local community so that the local community has voice, agency, and participation in the way that mine action and the immediate development work surrounding that takes place. And Prince Maret said, instead of using the term victims assistance, the phrase he used, and I really liked it, was survivor rights. You know, there's, um, and, and seeing it from a rights-based perspective. And when it comes to people's human rights and defending people's human rights, there's no easy way, as Prince Murray has reminded us. This is hard work, and this regards good determination, good coordination from all the development partners. So there you are. There are three thoughts that I thought I would try to share as a way to connect them. Um, successful mine clearance demands connected development. Landmine clearance is about human development. And that mine clearance is also about our human rights. And just in closing, I would also say that as we remember with much gratitude um, what we owe frontline defenders, frontline workers in this time of COVID, I think the other frontline workers that we should also be thanking and remembering is the, the brave women and men who actually clear the landmines here in Cambodia, in, in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and many of the other countries we've mentioned. And so uh, I think maybe we, we end uh, uh, this session also expressing our thanks uh, to these brave women and men. Um, so thank you, uh, Finola. I'll hand it back to you. Oh, thank you, Nick Beresford, UNDP resident representative in Cambodia for weaving this all together. And I think I was particularly struck about landmine clearance being about human development and of course, human rights. And thank you to everybody who took part in our panel today and also our speakers uh, at the beginning of this session. We hope that you've taken away something from it. So we thank you for your questions. It certainly seems from our live box that we had uh, some a great degree of interest and we look forward to seeing seeing how the dialogue develops in this action of decade. Uh, this recording will be available very shortly and we thank you for watching. I'm Vanilla Sweeney.